So okay, I think we are about ready to start. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, um, good evening uh, to everybody joining this webinar, um, the dawn of next level logistics, hosted by the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, which we'll abbreviate to SILT. My name is Andrew Young. I'm the vice chair of the North America branch of SILT. For those of you not aware of, of SILT, we are a professional body for everyone who works in uh, logistics and transport, both freight and passenger transportation. We have around 34,000 members in over 30 countries, and our mission is to develop the art and science of logistics and transport through research, education, networking, and, and the sharing of ideas. We do also, as well as webinars such as this, we support uh, the ongoing professional career development of, of our members, um, offering industry-based training. And also we award CILT or SILT certifications, which, which are recognized throughout the world. Now today's webinar offers a detailed and informed view of one of the, the more exciting developments that's happening in the logistics world today. That's the commercial utilization of autonomous vehicles. This has been a talking point in the industry for, for a number of years, and there's been a lot of progress. And there's also been a fair amount of hype around the opportunities that autonomous offers the industry. And whilst autonomous logistics for the surface transport remain in a fairly de developmental phase, I think it's fair to say that there's been significantly more progress with airborne autonomous logistics. And, and today, the use of drones in distribution, fulfillment, supply chains is, is a reality. So today's webinar is gonna explore where we are today. Um, and we're gonna look at this through the lens of two leading protagonists involved in logistics drone operations. So I'm delighted that we'll be joined today by Michael Zara, who's the president and CEO of Drone Delivery Canada. Um, as his title suggests, responsible for developing and executing the strategic plan of the company. And Michael will share a lot more about what Drone Delivery Canada does and his role. Also joining us today is, is Martin Roos, um, who's managing director of DSV Air and Sea Canada based in Milton, Ontario. And again, I'll allow Martin to introduce himself in more details. So before I hand over to, to Martin and, and Michael, um, we plan to have some time um, towards the end of this webinar to take questions and answer them. Um, so we really would invite all of you to provide any questions that you have by using the chat facility uh, which most people now know what that means uh, we're on Zoom. It's on the bottom of the screen. So please enter any questions in there and uh, we'll, we'll valiantly attempt to answer as many of those as possible during, uh, during this, this session. I'll also add that if we do get disconnected, if you just click back on the same link, that should get you back into the webinar. Um, everybody should be muted with their uh, camera off. Um, if, uh, if you see that that's not happening, we'd ask you just to do that so that uh, the speakers can kind of have their, their, their focus on the, the material that they're presenting. And the final thing I would add, today's session is being recorded, um, so be conscious of that. And, and also be aware that we will share with everybody who has registered a link to where you can uh, see the recording again. So watch that again at your leisure. Uh, it'll be listed on uh, Siltner's um, YouTube channel. Okay, so housekeeping over. Um, I don't think we need to delay any further. I'm going to now hand over to Martin and um, to kind of kick us off. So Martin, over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for, for joining us today. We've for a long period of time been very excited about this particular program and its development. Um, we started back in, in 2019. We'll get more into to the history and to the futures of it. 
I can start by introducing myself. I've been with DSV for 17 years on three different continents. I have always had a passion to not necessarily do things differently for the sake of doing them differently, but to explore new avenues and not always follow the, the beaten path. And I think that falls very well within the realms of how DSV globally operates. We want to innovate. We wish to continue to expand our service portfolio. We've always wished to be the best in class. We don't necessarily want to be the, the biggest. We want to be the best. And if that by definition makes us the biggest, then so be it. We will take that with us. Um, I think we're gonna start out with a little bit of a, a short video to introduce, um, and then we'll get back into it. Thank you. I don't know about you, but that video still gives me the chills. It's it's interesting to see where we've come from just a few years back where something like this year would be completely unheard of. Nevertheless, in, in 2019, DSV partnered up with Drone Delivery Canada through a mutual partner of ours. DSV is working with Air Canada to move a lot of freight. DSV is a, lo uh, a global logistics company with activities all over the world in more than 80 countries worldwide. Uh, we have an annual revenue a little bit in excess of 18 billion US dollars, and we have more than 56,000 staff working for DSV. We work with Air Canada in order to move freight from A to B, and Air Canada had just signed up with drone delivery as well and introduced us. So a big uh, thank you goes to Air Canada for actually making this program come to life. At the same time, as we started those discussions, DSV was building a new head office in Milton, Ontario uh, for our Canadian operations. It's a 1.2 million square feet facility that we wanted to explore a little bit more than just a regular warehouse, which was why we, we started to dig into this particular opportunity with Drone Delivery Canada. Next, please. Yeah, so instead of, of just following the beaten path, as I was mentioning before, we wanted to try something new. We wanted to be a part of shaping the industry. Instead of sitting back and waiting for the industry to be shaped around us and then having to catch up. So we saw the drone project as a very good opportunity for us to firsthand be a part of shaping it, gaining the experience, growing the product and learning it firsthand with our own staff and employees and seeing how we can help to shape the future. Next, please. So what you see here is a schedule of our, our an overview of our Milton facility and the two red Drone spots indicates where we are flying from and to. Might not seem of much, but as I mentioned, it's a 1.2 million square feet facility. Uh, it's the distance you're seeing there is, is 360 some odd meters that we are flying from one end of the facility to the other. Um, we can use that for a lot of internal avenues. We can use it for 
quality control of particular goods coming in. Um, we've been using it for, for couriers, for documentation, whatever need there is. And remember moving freight from one end of a warehouse to another is not as simple as just driving straight. There's typically a lot of racking, there's uh, people moving around in there. So to shift some of this movement outside provided more uh, time efficient and, and faster than what we could do had we had to transport the things inside within the warehouse. So that was uh, our initial uh, venture into the drone logistics, but we didn't go into this, this partnership only considering what can we move at DSV. That's where we wanted to hone our skills. That's where we wanted to gain our initial experience with this particular product and to explore, was it safe? Was it, was it reliable? Was it as sustainable as, as we had expected it to be? And did it live up to our expectations? Um, and for those of you who follow the news of drone delivery, you will see that we've recently extended our commercial agreement with drone delivery, which I think speaks a little bit to what, what our uh, explorations of this particular product here was. It's obviously positive. Next, please. So the timeline is, as, as you can see there, I won't bore you by uh, reading up what is on the screen. What I think is interesting is if we focus on what happened in Q3 2020 and subsequently what the future looks like for this. In Q3 2020, we established an external route which flew uh, with the base of, of drone delivery, uh, sorry, of DSV Canada's uh, head office. It flew from there and it flew roughly four kilometers into uh, a client of ours, uh, four kilometers away from us. But most interestingly was that it was very in innovative. We had to get various approvals in order to fly in over uh, a very trafficated highway one of the most trafficated in, uh, in Canada, which Michael will tell us a little bit about later. Um, but for us to actually be able to fly and deliver externally outside of the DSV facility was groundbreaking. Um, and that's uh, something that we will continue to peruse. This year was four kilometers. It was a, a limited period that we decided to fly this in. Um, our future pipeline, which is then when we look at the Q2 to Q4 2021, um, we have a few other opportunities that we are working on, uh, more or less each and every day, in order to see if we can if we can deploy. Um, there are some with the existing drones that we're flying. There are some with bigger drone expectations. There are some with multi-stop. There are some with temperature controlled and dangerous goods that we are exploring. So for us, it it's to a large extent about pushing the envelope constantly, not just as I said before, for the sake of doing it, but because we want to develop this particular product here. Um, so stay tuned and see what happens at least in Q3, Q4 of this particular year, but certainly also in the future, namely in 2022. And I know Michael will be speaking a little bit to that later as well. Next, please. Michael, this might be a good cue for you to come in and, and explain a little bit to us about the equipment that you've deployed out here at DSV and that we're flying around with. Sure, okay, thank you, Martin. Um, so as Martin indicated, the first route uh, was within the DSV premises and we fly typically from a drone spot depot, which you saw an image of in the previous slides to another drone spot depot. And that, that's our preferred model uh, it offers uh, an environment that's very disciplined and safe and secure, which is of particular importance to customers who are looking at high value or high risk cargo. There's, uh, there's access control, there are security cameras, weather station, way scales, and these sort of things. We also have the ability, as uh, some people who are familiar with Drone Delivery Canada, uh, no to drop cargo. And the second route that we did uh, with the DSV to an offsite DSV customer, we flew to the destination. We had minimal infrastructure there. We lowered an altitude, we dropped the cargo and we flew back. And, and Martin mentioned that we flew over the 401, which I, I think is actually the busiest road in the, in the world. And, you know, if you look at the regulations, a couple of years ago, we weren't allowed to fly over roads. And that was an example where we were flying a longer distance over the 401. So that was a very, very exciting opportunity. Here you can see the operations control center. The system runs unmanned automatically. We monitor 
all of our drones from the operations control center. And at the bottom, uh, as, as Martin mentioned, we have other drones uh, in our fleet. The Sparrow is commercialized and operational now. The Robin and Condor in development and uh, expected in the future. Uh, and there's room for expansion with DSV uh, into other markets or other customers. So very exciting project uh, that we kicked off with DSV and we've made a lot of progress, I think, in moving not just uh, the businesses together uh, forward, but also the industry as well by doing some new things. Thank you, Michael. We've identified a few of, of some of the verticals that we're seeing a good fit for drone delivery and, and it can be more or less everything. The, the only limitation at this moment is it is a new product. There's a lot of, of approvals from a regulatory perspective playing into where can you fly to and from? Can you fly in close proximity to an airport? Can you not? Can you fly in over trafficated highways? And that's where our partnership is important that we can continue to push that envelope and we can continue to develop where it's permissible to fly. And I think from a DSV perspective, what has been important for us is, is to continue to innovate, but also to show we can operate and fly a lot of flights and through that uh, extract the data to analyze the safety of it. Ultimately, what we wish at DSV is to take a lot of the existing traffic off of the roads um, in, in order to make the roads a little bit more available for, for users and not necessarily being blocked out by, by cargo movements. But we also want to make it easier to deliver cargo timely. Um, I think there's been a lot of other drone programs which has focused on business to consumer deliveries. What we're working with here is business to business. And as Michael was alluding to, it needs a drone spot infrastructure. So you can't just fly a drone and drop the freight and hope for the best and that the right recipient will receive it. Um, here, it's a little bit more focusing on regular A to B and maybe A to B to A deliveries where we fly milk runs. Um, we definitely look towards the condor, but also what's beyond the condor. Uh, in, in my ideal future scenario, I would like to see that we could pick up air freight pallets from the airport and have them flown out for further deconsolidations uh, or the other way around here at, at our DSV facility. So from our perspective, we're looking at close proximity projects, but we're also looking at, at the more remote and rural locations that could be oil and gas, uh, particularly where you have some very um, difficult to reach locations or destinations that for us would be natural to see, okay, how can we service these remote areas in, in a way where it's still dependable and reliable. And let's not forget, it's typically also much more sustainable and eco-friendly than uh, sending trucks or, or helicopters or whatever it might be to deliver the same freight. Next, please. So we've embraced the term that the future is now instead of, of planning and planning for the future and seeing what happens uh, around us. And that is our commitment. And we, of course, from a DSV perspective, want to do so in a very sustainable manner. Um, we're a transportation company. There are costs to, to move freight in a green manner. Um, and typically that cost will have to be paid by someone. Uh, that's typically the end consumer uh, as, as probably a part of the commodity value. But we will do from a DSV perspective, whatever we can to enable that transition to green. And the more freight we can pull off of the roads uh, and deliver sustainable, obviously, is what we're aiming to do. We also look, of course, at being able to deliver on time. That is, for many of our consignees, the most important, that they can plan their supply chain around a dependable schedule of when are you going to deliver. Um, and I think most of us also, as, as personal consumers, expect deliveries, you expect to be able to track it, you expect to understand where is your freight, why is it delayed, when can you expect it to move further. Um, and we see a lot of that integration being able uh, to be deployed together with drone delivery. Critical um, freight is something that we are also exploring. It could be healthcare, it could be medicinal purposes, it could be uh, for, for treatments, urgent treatments, it could be defibrillators, it could be any life-saving equipment that we can be able to deliver whenever it is required, which, which of course could be any time. 
The eco-friendliness and the sustainability, I have already spoken a little bit to, so we'll jump over that. And then from a growth and development perspective, it lies in our DNA. We wish to continue to grow through our innovation and through our services. Um, will it happen right now with a new product such as the drone deliveries? Probably not. Uh, like with anything new, it, it has to go through its infancy stages. That's where we are realistically, but we would much rather have a heavy hand in terms of how the product is going to develop than to sit on the sidelines. So our commitment to the future of drone logistics is definitely there, not just in Canada. We're looking into this from a North American perspective, as well as our European um, sister companies has also started to look into it. So it is the future one way or another. How it will look in uh, 10, 20 years from now, I don't have a crystal ball. I think Michael's crystal ball is probably a little bit clearer than mine. So maybe we should hand it over to him and see what we can sneak out of, of him from information. Thanks very much, Thank Mark. You. Yeah, that. you too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so before I get started, just a, a quick introduction, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the people on the call might uh, know Drone Delivery Canada a little bit and some might uh, might not at all. So uh, as was mentioned, my name is Michael Zara. I'm the president and CEO for Drone Delivery Canada. I've been with the company since 2018. Uh, my role was to take the company from a pre-revenue startup to a company that is now uh, operational and commercialized and generating early stage uh, revenue. And we've done that uh, successfully. And um, my background is in engineering and, and business and logistics. Uh, so uh, it was an exciting opportunity for me. You don't often have an opportunity in your life to work for a, a startup business in a startup industry, uh, which uh, is definitely exciting, uh, but comes with its trials and tribulations and, and challenges of doing that. So, and as Martin said, it's a nascent industry. Um, we're definitely one of the leaders globally, and I think the industry is at an inflection point where it's starting to grow and the pandemic, as much as it was uh, obviously uh, an unfortunate uh, circumstance, definitely raised the profile of, of the industry and, and the company. And, uh, and I think uh, we're generally at a point where uh, drones are, I guess, taking off, uh, so to speak, pun intended. So uh, with that, uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to be making some uh, some forward-looking statements. These are, are things that we anticipate uh, potentially in the future, and I'm going to really focus on uh, some market research that the, that we've seen that talks about the growth in e-commerce and the growth in, in drone delivery in general. So next slide, please. I'll, I'll just summarize uh, some of the slides as I proceed in the interest of, of time. But generally, we find when customers are looking at uh, drone delivery, they're looking at efficiencies and cost savings and convenience. But there's also an opportunity for new revenue streams. And as Martin mentioned, there are new things that you can't do today that maybe in the future you'll be able to do. And that creates new revenue. And that's exciting for mature businesses who are, are maybe looking for new channels for premium services or, or new revenue streams. And on this slide, uh, if you look down in the bottom right corner, uh, you can see an example of B2B, business to business parcel delivery, uh, comparing drone delivery from a cost and, and time point of view to some traditional uh, methods like bike courier or a traditional courier like FedEx. And, and clearly uh, research shows and we've demonstrated in our projects that drone delivery is more cost effective and, and faster in many instances. In the top left, this is an example of pharmaceutical deliveries to a residential consumer, for instance, as an example, comparing it to other traditional means. And again, you can see the drone delivery is more cost effective and, and faster. And time can be money uh, in commercial and industrial applications. And uh, you know, time can be money, can be lives in, in healthcare applications, as Martin mentioned, when you're moving things that are critical like defibrillators or, or pharmaceuticals. Uh, next slide, please. So there is anticipated growth, not only in e-commerce, but in e-commerce by drone. So if you look in the middle, you can see the anticipated e-commerce that's going to be delivered by drone. So not only is the e-commerce market growing rapidly and the pandemic certainly accelerated that, 
but the anticipated percentage of e-commerce that will be delivered by drone, and this is a combination of, of B2B as well as B2C, is expected to accelerate as well. So in 2025, research shows that it could be 13% of e-commerce delivered by drone, rapidly growing to 40% in, in 2030. And that's a large percentage of a very large number. If you look on the right side, you can see global parcel drone delivery revenue and some projected, uh, project, projected uh, growth uh, numbers from uh, 15 billion US dollars to 115 billion. So these are significant numbers uh, for e-commerce in general and then e-commerce delivered by drone. And this doesn't include other drone delivery applications that might be um, you know, non-commercial things like healthcare and, and First Nations and, and these sort of things. So it's definitely a market that the research shows is going to be uh, rapidly growing and uh, a very significant market. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we're not involved in hardware sales or, or mapping revenue, but if you look on the left, this is drone delivery revenue. And the, the research shows that estimates for the drone delivery platforms will generate nearly $50 billion in, in revenue. And by 2030, drone delivery platforms could scale another fourfold, generating $275 billion in revenue. And during the next five years, drones are expected to deliver more than 20% of parcel shipments. So you can see a very rapid acceleration, again, not just in e-commerce in general, but in parcels that are gonna be moved by drones, both B2B and B2C globally. And uh, this is obviously a significant market. It's very much still a nascent industry as, we, as we've discussed, but it's an industry that's uh, forecasted through a variety of research from third parties uh, to be a massive industry with significant growth. Um, next slide, please. So if we look at some third party uh, market studies, the global drone package delivery market is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 53% from 21 to, to 26. And drones and healthcare, uh, as we've mentioned, are, are really gaining traction even before the pandemic, and that's been accelerated by the pandemic. Medical drone delivery is expanding rapidly around the world. And with the evolution of uh, aviation regulations, on-demand cargo delivery becomes even more of a viable industry. And also consumer expectations are increasing. 50% of online shoppers favor same day or quick deliveries. I think gone are the days where three day delivery is acceptable, even next day delivery. People are looking at same day delivery or even same hour delivery. And this fits perfectly in with drone delivery. Consumer acceptance is also very high. Initially, many years ago, there was a little bit of resistance to drone delivery. People didn't really understand the benefits. And as you see projects, especially in healthcare, where there's social value, there's been an increase in consumer acceptance. So 87% like the idea of consumer delivery, of drone delivery, and 89% would use the service. So there's definitely a, a high and increasing consumer acceptance. Also seen with COVID-19, um, it's revealed other drone opportunities. It's heightened the frailties of many supply chains and innovation has become imperative for, for logistics companies to survive. Drones have enormous potential and last mile resource because they reduce the need for human intervention, are exceptionally fast. Uh, they can reach isolated locations and of which there are many in Canada, First Nations and non-First Nations isolated uh, communities as well as oil and gas and mining projects, which are typically uh, distant. Um, and uh, it's, of, it's, it's often tricky uh, with traditional vehicles, especially in Canada where we have seasonal roads and, and weather conditions. Uh, so this opens up new opportunities for logistics companies. Uh, next slide, please. In the industrial and commercial markets, there's been an increased adoption in the drone uh, delivery ecosystem. And there's also corporate demand for lowering carbon emissions. So. Uh, many companies are looking at uh, their, their greenhouse gas footprint as part of their ESG mandate. Uh, they're looking at lowering their carbon emissions and electric drones, of which we have the, uh, the Sparrow and the Robin, uh, are very efficient, obviously, and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But also even the Condor, which is gasoline powered, is very fuel efficient. So it allows companies not only to be more efficient and save money, but also to help the planet. Uh, drone package delivery is projected to grow from 528 million in 2020 
to 39 billion by 2023, uh, sorry, 2030, at a growth rate of almost 54% from 2020 to 2030. And the use of delivery drones in e-commerce, quick service restaurants, convenience stores, and the healthcare sector, among others, is increasing. So it's a nascent industry, but still we're seeing uh, rapid adoption and we're at an inflection point where uh, it's growing rapidly. Next slide, please. There was a very recent study by Deloitte in Canada uh, called Cargo Transport Nimble New Future. And in that, uh, they stated that transportation companies are under pressure to be more nimble and more flexible. And I think this has come as a result of the increased expectations from consumers and businesses. And also the pandemic, as I mentioned, generated uh, awareness of some weaknesses in existing supply chain. Last mile delivery or first mile delivery can be easily 40% or higher over overall logistics costs. And they also stated, uh, Deloitte stated that some companies are even exploring the use of drones and uh, Deloitte actually called out Drone Delivery Canada specifically in their research uh, publication. Uh, automation increases to control costs and improve productivity. So there's an increased investment in automation in the supply chain. Uh, and that includes drones in addition to robotics and other platforms. And there's a look, there's a, uh, companies are looking to improve efficiencies and, uh, and process automation, which lends itself perfectly to, uh, to drones. Next slide, please. So what we found is there's typically four use cases for drones, hard to access locations. And again, these could be indigenous or non-indigenous communities. They could be oil and gas or mining projects where, which are often uh, very remote. It could be coastal communities. Uh, and this is a perfect application for uh, drone delivery. There's also time critical deliveries, where again, as I mentioned, time could be uh, lives for healthcare type applications or time is money for commercial industrial applications. And with the pandemic, there's a, a third and a fourth use case that came to light, limiting person to person contact. You may have a hospital or a medical lab or a senior's home where you don't want cross contamination, but you need to keep the supply chain open. And we actually did two First Nations projects in Ontario where the mandate was really to limit person to person contact, to uh, eliminate outside influence into the community and potentially be bringing uh, the virus into the community. So limiting person to person contact was a new one that came about as a result of the pandemic and then disaster recovery and business continuity. As I mentioned, the, the pandemic highlighted the frailty and, and lack of a, a backup to supply chain and companies are looking at drones uh, for that application as well. Next slide, please. Martin covered some of the, uh, the vertical markets where drones uh, are being used. Uh, these are markets that, that we address. Uh, I mentioned a few of them already, remote communities, indigenous and non-community, non-indigenous. There are over a thousand indigenous communities in Canada. And of course, there are many remote communities that are poorly served. And as a result, there's a poor, uh, there's poor healthcare infrastructure. Uh, there's lower quality of life. And, and these are things that the government is, is looking to address. Last mile, first mile courier routes, uh, very inefficient, very expensive. And as I mentioned, oil and gas and mining applications, and then healthcare in general, and a variety of other applications. Our focus is predominantly on delivery, but we're also seeing applications where drones can carry cameras and sensors and these sort of things. And these are things that we're exploring secondarily to, uh, to drone delivery. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some examples of First Nations projects that we've done. Uh, the Stellatin First Nation in combination with the University of British Columbia and TD Bank uh, is one that we announced a little while ago. Uh, that's an exciting project that uh, we'll be implementing shortly and will be up and running. We've also done uh, other projects in Ontario, some related to the pandemic and some general uh, projects uh, before the pandemic. But both Soleil and Georgina were specifically related to the pandemic and the desire to isolate themselves from outside influences and visitors, but also keep the supply chain open. Uh, next slide, please. So these are some examples of commercial customers. I won't go into detail. Obviously, DSV is there and the recently announced Edmonton International Airport project as well, which is Edmonton International Airport, uh, Apple Express and Zing Final Mile uh, as participants. So we had an LOI with EIA, we had an LOI with Apple Express, and we're excited to convert those to projects and add a third customer to this project, Zing Final Mile. So very excited about uh, commercial applications as well. Next slide, please. 
And as we've talked about, healthcare in general is where drones um, have really seen a lot of traction in Canada and globally. It plays well into remote access and it plays well into uh, time critical deliveries where time could be live. So we've done a number of AED projects where we've raced an ambulance uh, in a simulated 911 call. And we've repeatedly shown that a AED in a drone can get there faster than a ambulance attending to somebody having a cardiac arrest. So we could be saving lives with drones as well. We also, as Martin mentioned, have the ability to do temperature monitoring and temperature control. This is important for moving things like blood, biologicals, and vaccines. So we've done a project with the University of Saskatchewan to demonstrate the efficacy of doing that as well. So next slide, please. So in the end, I think we've talked about why uh, drones are beneficial and drone delivery uh, makes sense in a variety of applications and vertical markets and use cases. Why Drone Delivery Canada? Uh, clearly, we are a leader in the industry from a technology point of view and uh, the commercial projects that we are in the process of uh, signing and implementing. Uh, it's a tested, proven and reliable technology. We are fully commercialized and operational. Uh, it's a great Canadian success story. Uh, all the intellectual property is ours um, and we are approved by the regulator in Canada, Transport Canada, uh, and we have a long-standing and collaborative relationship with them, which is very, very important. And also we have relationships with the FAA in EASA in Europe and in India and Africa as well. So we feel that we're very well positioned for the expanding uh, and very exciting market ahead of us. So with that, next slide. I will wrap up. If there are any uh, questions, uh, we can take them now or after the conference. If you want to reach up, reach out to us, you can visit us on social media, our website for more information, or reach us at info at dronedeliverycanada.com. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Andrew. Well, Michael, thank you very much. And, and Martin as well. Um, really fascinating topic and uh yeah some really good material that you both spoke through there um we've we've actually generated quite a lot of questions already um i'll just also share that we we're doing great for time we have about 20 minutes so chance uh, to cover quite a lot of questions if anybody has any additional things to ask so let's let's kind of start to look at some of the things that we've been getting through um i'm going to tie a couple together here uh, maybe start with you, Michael, um, and uh, Martin could maybe chip in as well. But I, I, you presented a slide in terms of the um, the, the capacity of, of, of the drones, the kind of uh, ranges that are possible. C could you talk a little bit more about whether that's kind of the one-way range, what the return range is? And, and I think linked to that, uh, a question we had from, from Jim uh, Wire was, you know, are we talking just one device, one drone here, one vehicle, um, or are you kind of pooling um, these as part of your operations? So, Michael, if you want to start on that, and then maybe Martin can can add. Sure. So I, I'll answer the second question uh, first. So, in in terms of you know what a project would look like, whether it's a single drone or multiple drones, that that entirely depends on the customer. You could easily envision that it's a simple project. Uh, two drone spots going from A to B back to A. But you can also envision that there will be applications where you may have one point of origin, multiple points of destinations. There's also going to be instances where there's a milk run, as, as Martin mentioned, or any kind of network that the, uh, the customer is looking for. With our logistics software, which is called Flight, F-L-Y-T-E, which is also our intellectual property, we have the ability to do a variety of configurations of networks. So definitely, uh, there could be projects in the future that have a co more complex uh, uh, complex network. In terms of the capability of the drones, the, the Sparrow is the smallest drone, which is the one that's fully commercialized and operational now, has a range, uh, as we saw in one of the slides, of 30 kilometers and a payload of 4.5 kilograms or about, uh, about 10 pounds. And then as you move up to the largest drone in the, in the portfolio of three, you have the Condor, which is gasoline powered, very fuel efficient versus a, a helicopter and, and very economical versus a helicopter, of course. It also has a range of uh, 200 kilometers and a payload capacity of 180 kilograms, about 400 pounds. So you can see 
the range and the payload capacity allows you to reach more remote customers or remote locations and communities. Again, First Nations communities, oil and gas and mining applications. So uh, really that's what we have today. You can envision uh, that there will be something in the future beyond the, the condor. Um, but uh, at this point, we're focused on, uh, on, on the portfolio that we have today. I would say from a DSV perspective, the, the way we've grown to what we are today is largely because of consolidating freight. But you have to remember with the current drones, and it is a very early stages, it's, it's rather limited what you can put in there in terms of how big uh, consignment can you actually put in. So, so to speak about consolidations is probably a little bit too premature at this stage, at least with the current equipment. Once we start scaling that up to, to the condor and maybe to what comes after that, that's really when we can start seeing the benefits of consolidations and where I think DSV will really start to adapt more to using drones at a broader level. So from our perspective, we're ready to grow. We want to grow with DDC and we wish to have as many drones flying as, as possible. And I think, Andrew, that could tie into some of the other questions uh, I've seen with the bandwidth of, of DDC, how many drones can, op can be operating at the same time, et cetera. Uh, yes, yes, thank, thank you guys. Uh, you, you can see the number of questions. We've got various themes coming through. So just maybe change track a little bit around the theme. This is a little bit more of a, a, a transportation planning um, or future um, scenario. And that, that's really around, you know, you've you've identified the real potential for growth i mean we are scratching the surface at the moment and you're expecting an explosion but what about some of the practicalities of the airspace um and is there is there studies is there moves to whether that's 3d kind of traffic um modeling and um and also i mean linked to that you know um how you can kind of monitor multiple routes at the same time is 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 this kind of turning into the air traffic control that we see in the in the traditional aviation industry? Uh, maybe I can I can take a stab at that first. So our our, our flight software, which is part of our uh, turnkey solution, essentially does air traffic control, but we're not constantly sending commands to the drone to. Uh, tell it what to do. It has a pre-programmed route based on what the next route happens to be and the next destination happens to be depending on what the customer network looks like. Uh, let's assume you know point A to B and back to A. Um, our flight software monitors the airspace, monitors our drone, um, monitors other aircraft, monitors weather. So essentially it's an automated uh, ATC if you will down the road, uh, there are a number of governments, essentially, uh, and large companies who are looking at something called UTM, which is Universal Traffic Management. As you can imagine, in the in the future, there will be multiple companies with multiple drones flying, and how do you coordinate all of that together? And that'll be done through something called a, a UTM system. But that's, I would say, that's in the in the distant future. Uh, right now, we're focused on our, our own network and our own projects, and we definitely have the ability to fly in active controlled airspace. We've flown uh, in active controlled airspace at airports in Canada and even the United States in the past, and obviously the Edmonton International Airport is going to be exactly that. So there is complexity in the airspace. There are regulations, but uh, we're quite comfortable with the, our ability to do that. Okay, yep. Yeah, thank you for that uh... Uh, Michael and and linked to that as well. Um, some questions that we've been having about operations in uh, uh, at night, uh, and also if you could maybe update us on wh where where's the regulations around you know the the the, the line of sight and uh, where you'd expect that going, not just in Canada but in the U.S. as well. Um, I obviously know in the U.S. I. I'm based out of Dallas Fort Worth and a large railroad here, BNSF, was awarded by the FAA permission to operate beyond line of sight um, and kind of use that as an experimental approach, which has been running for a few years now. So are, are those two areas that you see as crucial to your business plans and, uh, and wh wh where are they at the moment? So your, your first question about flying at night, we can, we can definitely fly you know, during the day, 
uh, at night, uh, rain, snow. So that's uh, that's not an issue. In terms of beyond visual line of sight or, or beave loss, as it's, as it's called, in, in Canada, the, the beave loss operations, uh, which we have done, are done through a, a waiver system. So there are what they call part nine operations, which is typically what everybody flies in. And if you're looking at doing a beave loss operation, you apply for a waiver, which we've successfully done in the past, and you allow to, uh, you're allowed to fly beave loss. So that's really a case by case. And it's probably more uh, inclined to be towards um, very low density suburban or rural and remote applications where you would see uh, beef loss. So we have done beef loss op operations in the past and we have a successfully applied for waivers. So in Canada, it's done through a waiver system. In the US, it's, it's slightly different, but there are some similarities depending on a graduated population density model, slightly different than, than what we have in Canada. But there are abilities to do beef loss operations through a, a waiver process. Okay, that's fine. I'm not sure if Martin, if you wanted to add anything onto that in terms of DSV um, and uh, where you may see regulatory um, changes or developments really, really re necessary for your continued drone expansion. Um, no, I can only say that, that uh, that's where the partnership of DSV and, and drone delivery really comes into play, that we can continue to push the boundaries and help to shape the industry, be that that we uh, fly cargo that otherwise wouldn't be flown in drones, it could be radioactive, it could be anything, or that we try new routes or we keep applying for new routes. But the best way of getting those approvals is really to show the reliability of the product. Um, so that's for us, fly, 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 fly. Okay, so let's pick up on one of the points, which is really about some of the economics uh, here. Um, now, clearly lots of variables, but uh, just in terms of an idea of uh, the, the costs of, of, of moving, say the cost per kilogram mile, um, does that differ on range? Does that differ in terms of the, the cargo being carried regardless of weight? Could, could you share any kind of metrics or information around that? Yeah, I can give it a go. And then, Michael, if you, if you wish to round it off, you can. Of course, uh, cost is, is really an important factor when it comes to transportation. But I think when you're talking about this last mile delivery or, or pickup, and you're talking about a solution where it's, it's dedicated, either pickup or delivery, it has to be on time. Um, and if you do something dedicated as a drone delivery, then you commit to a certain level of costs. And I won't necessarily come up with a ratio of, of how much more expensive it is to deliver with a drone because it all depends on where we're delivering from or to. What I would say is the higher the value of, of the freight, that, that's typically where it makes most sense. But you can then also argue it doesn't have to be the, the, the monetary value of the freight. It could also be the importance of it reaching in time. And then to try to put a price on that is, is obviously something different. So we hope that we in DSV can continue to grow and, and monetize the drone delivery platform. Um, but the pricing of it is, is, is not that you can put a standard price per kilo up on it because there are so many different factors that plays into it. Michael, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it ultimately depends on density and, and frequency and these sort of things. But I think it's important for people to realize it's, it's not the intention for drone delivery to replace all traditional means. I mean, we're never going to be replacing a, a, a full uh, dedicated, uh, you know, 18 wheeler tractor trailer that's driving across the country, for instance, from coast to coast. These are, I would say, more niche applications where, uh, as I mentioned in the use cases where access is difficult, there are instances in the logistics world where you've got very long windshield time, very long stem time. It's very, very, very inefficient. Uh, you've got seasonal roads, you've got uh, dangerous isolated roads, you've got uh, you know, projects that don't have road access in, in, in a variety of coastal communities, for instance. So uh, the applications really fall into leveraging what the sweet spot is for drone delivery. And that's where access is difficult or time is critical. And it, it's hard to put a dollar amount on that because it's going to vary from 
uh, one project to the other. I mean, uh, a hospital moving urgent uh, lab samples to a laboratory is going to be very different economics than a, a mining uh, company that is using a drone on an infrequent basis, only for the supply, I would say, emergency repair parts. So the economics vary from one extreme to the other. And then when you look at healthcare and quality of life and and food security and these sort of things and, and, and indigenous communities, it's hard to put any any dollar amount on that. So. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that. That was a little bit of a tough tough one to kind of provide an answer to. So uh, I, I, I think, well, well done there. Um, so um, I, I guess it's a little bit linked to this, but it's more of an environmental question. Um, I mean, there are green credentials, uh, of course, from using uh, drones, and, and you, you spelt that out. Um, I was interested to hear that you, you know, you have uh, kind of uh, petrol-driven as well as uh, electric um, um, vehicles, which, which is interesting. So I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the kind of environmental um, uh, impact, or maybe you know the comparative version of that. I mean. Uh, one of the things that I'm very conscious of and, you know, a big theme that we're seeing in last mile logistics is this explosion in same day rapid delivery is that uh, there is a, you know, there's an environmental cost of that. So I'm just thinking this could be a real opportunity for, for drones. Um, but interested to hear what your view is in terms of the environmental aspects. I don't know, Martin, if you want to go first on that. Well, I think it ties a little bit into the, the equipment that we are able to use. Uh, I've already, when I spoke earlier, I explained what, what the vision of DSV is, be that from our facilities to the material that we use. And we do see that everything going forward will have to become more green. We have to consider what kind of a planet we're leaving to the next generation. And I think it's small little steps like this here and now us exploring drone deliveries that can perhaps, perhaps not help to drive us in that right direction. What I can guarantee you is that if companies such as us do not explore these opportunities, we will not, we will not benefit in any way, shape or form, which is our commitment to the, the planet that we want to try to explore these better options. Whether it works out or not, time will tell, but there's, there's a lot of different equipment being deployed, not just by drone delivery, but also by other drone delivery companies um, and shipping lines are trying to go green as well, which is where we see DSV move. So we hope that Michael and, and his team at DDC will be able to provide solutions for DSV that can make everything more green. Um, and then we will try to fit that into the supply chain of our customers. Yeah, and there's, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, there's definitely an increased focus uh, from companies as well as boards of companies on ESG, so environment and social and, and governance. So the, there are many, many very inefficient processes and very many inefficient and expensive and, and money losing routes in logistics. So I mean, there are instances where we've seen an example in a, in a First Nations community where some of them are isolated, they might even be in an island, and you have an elder within the community who needs to go for a blood test. So they would take that elder, they would put him or her on a dedicated helicopter, a very traumatic experience for them, incredibly expensive to dedicate a helicopter to move one person, well, why not just use a, a Sparrow drone to actually move the blood test uh, from a clinic to a lab instead of moving the person. So there are some very, uh, significant inefficiencies that are also impactful on the environment. You know, compare the greenhouse gas footprint from a, a full-size helicopter versus a sparrow just to move uh, a blood test. So there is definitely an increased focus on the environment and some inefficiencies that drones can address. Okay, thank you very much for, for um, answering those points. Um, I am a little conscious of time. We've probably got time for just one last question. Um, and apologies to everybody that has asked the very many questions that we've received. Um, but uh, we, I am conscious that we have quite an international audience for this webinar, um, number of people from outside of North America. So I'll just pick up one question for you, Martin, 
um, around uh, DSV's uh, expansion in, in other markets, particularly Europe was asked about, but interested in your, your view beyond that. And actually, Michael as well, if Drone Delivery Canada might kind of be looking beyond just Canada. So Martin, if you could pick that up first. Thank you. Yeah, well, we are a Danish company. Uh, we're listed on the Danish Stock Exchange and we have raw significant activities in Europe. Uh, we keep acquiring companies that we subsequently integrate into the business model of, of DSV. Most recently, we've bought Agility Logistics, which we hope to be able to integrate later this year. Uh, my point being that we continue to expand the footprint of DSV. And we simply do that because we wish to be able to deliver similar services across any part of the globe. And that to some extent also ties into our relationship with drone delivery. Um, I have put Michael and his team in, in touch with our US counterparts, and I know they're looking into uh, expanding the services to USA. Um, when it comes to Europe, well, then I'll leave it to you to comment, Michael, because I know it's not that easy to just operate as a, as a carrier in Europe as it is maybe over here. Yeah, thanks, Martin. So, you know, we have definitely, as, as people may know, uh, partnered with uh, Air Canada, uh, acting as our commercial partner and reseller, not just for opportunities in Canada, but also globally. Uh, we did sign some uh, LOI partner agreements with companies in Africa, in India. Uh, we announced a while ago that we had started the process to enter the United States. We're obviously a Canadian company, so we're focused primarily on, on gaining traction in Canada, which we've done. Um, we have flown in the US before. Uh, we do have the ability to fly under what's called part 107 uh, tomorrow in the United States. The international markets are important to us. It is a long process. The process requires uh, regulatory approval, uh, may require some proof of concept projects with the local regulator, we have been invited by regulators around the world to provide guidance as they write their uh, drone regulations, because not all countries are as advanced as, uh, as Canada and the United States, for instance, uh, are in terms of regulation. So we're definitely uh, plugged into international markets and we anticipate that we will see traction in international markets, whether it's the United States or Europe or uh, the African continent. Um, or India, but um, definitely it's a, it's a longer process because of the, uh, the regulatory process. So uh, definitely on our radar, uh, but it's more longer term. Okay, well, well thank you. And I wish, wish you both the best of luck with that expansion. Um, hopefully events like this webinar can help expose what you're doing and open up those for you. So we are now kind of unfortunately up to the end of the, the hour. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank Michael and Martin for all of their work and their time in presenting to us today, um, being slightly grilled on some questions as well. Um, we will take a look at some of the points that we've been sent through and try and answer those after the event. Um, I would like to thank everybody that's joined us today and remind you all that this will be available for viewing again on Siltner's YouTube channel. We'll also contact everybody and ask you to complete a short questionnaire. It's very important for us to get your feedback. It helps us plan these events in the future and also keep an eye on Siltner's website and our mailings for our next webinar event. So at that point, I'd like to wish everybody a good rest of your day, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the next event. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you.